Good morning. It's a beautiful sunny Sunday morning in the Sacramento Valley, California. And it's a beautiful day. I mean, there's a nice breeze accompanied by some clouds in the sky. There were some uh, just half an hour ago. And I'm looking forward to a nice and a beautiful day in the valley. So this is the last week of uh, summer in the Sacramento Valley. And I'm pretty sure that most of the residents of Sacramento, uh, well, I mean, I'll take it back. It's the last week of summer in the Northern Hemisphere and the Sacramento Valley as well. And I'm pretty sure that most of the residents of the Sacramento are looking forward to summer to come to an end, to conclude, and for fall season to start because of how dry it has been for the past really six, seven months. It rained very little, which is bad news for a lot of uh, the fruit trees. They have to be irrigated. Uh, bad news for me because I have to come and irrigate the fruit trees on a regular basis. So last year about this time I made a video about jujubes and how drought tolerant they are and uh, that's great news for uh, the residents of the Sacramento because they can uh, plant a fruit tree that is extremely drought tolerant and can put out a good fruit set uh, continuously one year after the other. And that's pretty important because uh, these don't have to be watered that much. If you get maybe 20 inches of rain in a year these should be able to sustain themselves quite remarkably. And the fruit is really of the highest quality. This particular variety, this is the, uh, the Lee jujube that is still fertile. We can try uh, fruits, uh, this particular one. So one thing you want to be very careful with jujubes, these branches, they're fraught with uh, kind of nasty, sharp thorns. So you want to make sure that even for picking a fruit, if you're not experienced with jujubes, put on some gloves and maybe use a pruner to cut off a you know, piece of fruit from the stem. Uh, just be very careful. And if you have kids who tend to come and play in the backyard, just make sure that they're protected. Maybe put your jujube in like an isolated spot that is not accessible by the kids. And uh, or also if you plan to come and prune these, make sure you put on some gloves. It's uh, happened to me a few times. It happened to me this morning too. Actually, I got a thorn still in my finger, so I got to pull it out. So just be careful. They got nasty sharp thorns but it's just one little uh, compromise we have to take for getting a great addition in our backyard as far as a good fruit tree that's drought tolerant self-fertile and uh, it ha also has the ornamental appeal so you might wonder what is this thing now it's uh, it's a pretty unfortunate situation now this is a cornelian cherry that belongs to the dogwood family uh, it's the uh, I think it's one of the two fruiting dogwood varieties the fruit is uh, astringent kind of sweet at the same time it's very delicious and uh, it's native to the Middle East the northern part of the Middle East like northern Iran uh, and also the uh, parts of the, uh, the Eastern Europe so those places that the weather gets very cold extremely cold and these are uh, cold hardy down to like minus 30 Fahrenheit uh, but they're not really adapted to grow in kind of arid environment like the one in Sacramento. So if you notice uh, how the leaf is actually turning kind of yellow and, and green, uh, uh, sorry, and, uh, and brown, that's because the rate at which the, uh, the water evaporates from the leaves is lower than the rate at which the water is absorbed by the root system. So then you start noticing uh, leaves turning brown and uh, yellow like this. So. This one in particular, I mean, we have an, uh, another type of Cornelian cherry that's, uh, that's doing a little bit better than this. It's, it's not really thriving, but uh, it's not in a bad shape like this one. Uh, I don't think it's a situation that can be rectified because I've been watering this guy pretty regularly. But uh, it's just, uh, just a problem. So if you, if you live in Sacramento and the places that are kind of arid and really uh, drought striking, then you might want to consider not planting something that is not really adapted to uh, this environment. Uh, I, I mean, I, I really like this tree. I mean, it, it's, it likes to grow as a shrub. You can train this to grow like a tree, but it prefers to grow like a shrub. And uh, I think in the second, third year, when we planted this, we had a nice fruit set coming out of it because back then the Sacramento got pretty cold in wintertime. It rained regularly, but that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. So. Yeah, just uh, for the uh, tree, 
not to suffer, it's better to shy away from uh, a tree uh, and planting it in your backyard. So just consider something else, consider something like a jujube. So let's try get a bite out of this uh, nice fruit. As excellent, as great as always. Um, the sugar level is up there, super crunchy, very nice. I'm very happy with it. So, do jujubes require fertilizers? Well, sometimes. Depends on uh, if your fruit set, in comparison to what you got last year, drops. You might want to consider applying some fertilizers. I was uh, browsing through the web. I noticed there's a website that say you need to apply the 10-10-10 uh, type of fertilizer. So, so that signifies. Uh, so when you have three digits, something dash, something dash, something dash. That's the NPK ratio. That's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium ratio. And 10% is the equivalent of 100,000 parts per million. So if you buy fertilizer, so 10% of that is nitrogen, 10% is phosphorus, and 10% is potassium. And that's the equivalent of 100,000 ppm of each, if you, if you cared about that you know, conversion. Uh, so what is the role of nitrogen? Now, nitrogen is pretty important is mo in most of the biological activities that a tree or plants have. It's involved in the structure of the proteins, uh, the genetic material, the nucleic acids, and so on and so forth. I mean, if you know the proteins are made of amino acids, amino acids, uh, they have the amide functional group, and that's a nitrogen-based functional group. So you have a nitrogen that is attached to carbon that's doubly bonded to another oxygen, and then that's connected to another uh, carbon. So that's an amide group, so a carbon, nitrogen, and then a double bond, and oxygen on the top. So that's really the basis of uh, the amino acids, and uh, the amino acids are the subunits of proteins, and proteins and enzymes are proteins. So it's involved in all the enzymatic reactions in, in the plant. That's how important they are. And they're also involved in the uh, structure of the nucleic acids, the genetic material of the, uh, of the cell. So lack of nitrogen can have drastic consequences uh, for the tree and for the plant. So it's a good idea to apply nitrogen fertilizer every once in a while. You can also have your soil tested for nitrogen to find out what the level of uh, different types of nitrogens are. And by that, I mean uh, the, uh, the form of nitrogen that's known as the ammoniacal nitrogen. And that uh, includes uh, really ammonia and uh, urea. So now, so urea actually within a few days should be converted to ammonia uh, by the enzyme called the urease and the uh, just a side note urea actually was the uh, the compound that dispelled the myth of the vitalism theory uh, there was this theory out there that somehow the uh, organic compounds they have this vital force that's uh, kind of driving them forward but there was a German scientist I forgot his name uh, he was able to synthesize uh, urea from uh, ammonium cyanate so I think he subject he got the ammonium cyanate and then uh, it was uh, he applied some heat to the uh, to, to the reaction and then uh, the the end product was uh, was urea so you can synthesize uh, really organic uh, compounds from uh, their non-organic counterparts
so if you have urea, you have ammoniacal, uh, ammonia, that, that constitutes um, ammoniacal nitrogen. So that's the one that doesn't need to be converted to anything, and the plant can actually take that up. So then there comes the point of uh, nitrogen fixating plants. Now, there's this misconception out there that some of the plants, they have the capability of absorbing the nitrogen from the atmosphere, and then uh, they can actually release ammonia into the soil. That's not the case. It's really a symbiotic relationship that these plants establish with uh, type of bacteria that they are equipped with the uh, nitrogenase enzymes. And that's an enzyme that can convert uh, the uh, atmospheric nitrogen into uh, NH3, which is ammonia, and then that can be absorbed by the, uh, by the tree. There's also nitrate and there's also uh, nitrite. So nitrite is the toxic form of, uh, of nitrogen-based products and nitrate is the one that can be converted to ammonia and then can be consumed by the plant. So for that, you need an enzyme, which is uh, called the ammonia or nitrate reductase. Uh, so take a, take a step back. So if you have nitrate, so nitrate has to be converted to nitrite and nitrite has to be converted to ammonia and then can be absorbed by, by the tree. So it's important for your soil and for the plants to have molybdenum because the enzyme that is involved in that particular reaction is a molybdenum-based enzyme. So for nitrate to be converted to nitrite and for nitrite to be converted to ammonia, uh, there needs to be an enzyme uh, to facilitate that transformation. So it's, uh, it's a nitrate reductase and nitrite reductase enzyme, and those are all molybdenum-based enzymes. So molybdenum is an element in the periodic table, or it, well, it's actually a naturally occurring element. Uh, if you look at the periodic table, you have group 1 and group 2. You have group 1, you have sodium, potassium. Group 2, you have beryllium, magnesium. And before you get to group 3, which is uh, boron and aluminum, you have all these transi transition metals in between. And in the fourth group of the transition metals, you have uh, molybdenum. So it's very important in the, all the uh, enzymatic activities of the, uh, the plants and the trees that result in uh, the absorption of nitrogen. So lack of molybdenum, which is, it's, it's kind of rare for your soil to be stripped of molybdenum because of over irrigation, but it can happen. And if it happens, it results in your fruit set declining uh, and your leaves not come to uh, full maturity. And uh, so it, it, it'll have drastic consequences for, for the plant and the tree. So you can have your soil tested for molybdenum content uh, and it's, it's really a micronutrient. It should be present in very low concentrations, uh, but it's important nonetheless. So, so as I said, you, in order for ammonia to be absorbed by the, uh, by the tree, if you apply fertilizer of the nitrate variety, you have to convert that to nitrite and then to ammonia. And those are all molybdenum-based enzymes. So over application of nitrate fertilizer can result in uh, molybdenum deficiency and that will result in nitrogen deficiency as well because you don't have any uh, enzyme to convert your uh, nitrate to nitrite and consequently to ammonia so it can, can be absorbed by the tree. So those are all the things to consider. The other type of fertilizers I referred to in the beginning was uh, the P and K, phosphorus and potassium. As we know, phosphorus is also involved in uh, the genetic material, so it's important in the genetic transfer, it's important in crop maturity, 
in uh, you know the uh, the root development and so on and so forth and potassium is also important in the activation of uh, I don't know 70 or 80 different types of enzymes so these are all pretty important elements and it's it might be worthwhile to have your soil tested by a certified laboratory on a regular basis just to make sure that there is enough of those nutrients in the soil and that can be uh, absorbed by the tree and uh, you can have a nice fruit set. Uh, so this is an excellent uh, fruit set this year, although this uh, particular one actually was pruned quite heavily in wintertime. I really pruned this tree down, uh, but it's grown back up. Uh, I do perform summer pruning and I also perform uh, uh, winter pruning. So. If I do that, I'll, I, I plan to make another video and show you how I prune the trees and uh, what considerations I have in mind before I approach it. I don't just come in blindly, start, you know, cutting off, hacking away, you know, the branches. I, th there's a plan. It's, uh, it's something that's contrived on the spot, but there's also a plan in mind that uh, you just have to approach it with like a... It has to be premeditated. It has to be a... You have to have some prior agenda before you do that. <coughs> Yeah, while I'm enjoying this great piece of fruit, I wish you a wonderful uh, Sunday and I'll see you in another video. Take care, bye. Now, before I wrap up this clip into a conclusion, it's important not to uh, provoke your fruit trees into a state of jealousy by favoring one tree over the other. And that really applies to this Bartlett pear I talk a lot about uh, mulberries and uh, cornelian cherries and jujubes and sometimes I neglect talking about this uh, uh, Bartlett pear and it really doesn't give it its deserved attention. Uh, it's a great addition to anyone's backyard. It's a beautiful tree. It's an adore fruit stock. It's pretty much maintenance free. You don't have to uh, prune it as much. A little bit of summer pruning, a little bit of detailed kind of winter pruning. Uh, is pretty much sufficient but the fruit set is always excellent on this tree and the fruit has a lot of character to it the flavor is excellent when you pick it fresh from a branch you want to put it on the counter and let it to soften up a little bit before you can consume it but it's just a wonderful uh, wonderful tree and uh, it's very much also pest resistant and doesn't require much fertilization either so it's a great addition to anyone's backyard and uh, I really love this tree